Well, thanks for all making the uh, time to come to our session before lunch and before the Shark Tank, of course. And it really is a, a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to this session because we're looking at the future of think tanks in Europe. And to discuss these crucial issues for all of us, we are really, these are fundamental topics and really delighted to be joined on stage by uh, a very much a celebrated and expert panel to take us through some of these topics. On my right here, I've got Olga Vavandovic, who is from the Liberté Foundation. And we've also got Alexander Skouras from the Center for Liberal Studies. And at the end, Stefan Achimovic from Students for Liberty will be able to give their specific views, perspectives, and thoughts on some of these topics. But Maybe if I can just kick things off by turning to Olga to say a little bit about the communications landscape at the moment. How is this changing? And how are you utilizing new technologies in order to get your messages across to cut through the noise? Starting on a tough note, a note I see. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all, to the Atlas Network. Uh, I'm really excited for this debate because I'm really curious to see what our answer to the question what the future of think tanks in Europe will be. From my point of view, uh, our foundation, uh, which started as a media outlet in Poland, basically, we have developed quite a number of different activities. We have div diversified quite significantly throughout the years. But when it uh, comes to the media landscape, I think uh, most of us will share some, some common ground in this regard. Uh, obviously, it's changing. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no other way to say it. Uh, we have, you know, uh, chat, G, uh, chats, uh, inter interactive chats that actually use AI to, to do our job, as people say. But are they really doing our job? I'm not that convinced. Uh, I think that's the same debate that we've had with uh, automatized translations. Mm. Uh, I'm a translator myself. Everyone was scared at first, right? So, they will take our jobs away from us, right? Is that really the case? Not really. Why? For precisely a very simple reason. AI is not human. AI cannot differentiate between values. Uh, it cannot really uh, see, um, it can make, make predictions, of course, uh, based on the algorithms that it has, but it cannot really be a full, well-rounded, informed, individual and I think we as humans as individuals that's precisely our mm. edge and advantage that I don't see it changing anytime soon uh, we have to be on the lookout for new technologies for mm. sure if we don't want to become obsolete as think tankers we have to watch and carefully what's happening out there uh, the another aspect of this debate is of course what was tackled in the morning right uh, misinformation, and yesterday in Peter Pomerantsev's speech, misinformation uh, and troll farms and whatnot. But uh, I don't think we, as members of the think tank world, should be maybe not afraid of that. We should be careful about what is happening. But we have our job, we have our agenda, we have what to do, and I think we should focus on that. So monitor what's happening out there, utilize what you can and what you see that benefits you and getting your message across, whatever it is. If you want to use chat GTBP, then that's fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. Uh, but for us, at our foundation, we have not been actually resorting to those tools yet uh, for a simple reason. We don't think it's of value that much to us. Whenever we create some kind of content, we do it very much hands-on. Uh, and because we have a very skilled team, we can do that. But of course, it can alleviate some of the burdens of having a heavy workload in the mm. future. We shall see. So start where you are, use what you've got. Alex, what do you think about this? I mean, how do we sort of... Uh cut through the noise, let alone be seen as trusted advisors in this more complicated, difficult space? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I'm, I'm also delighted to be here today, even though my left foot doesn't agree with me. <laughs> I'd rather be somewhere in a hospital. Uh, but um, uh, I'm going to take advantage number of two things. Number one, that this is a packed room, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. 
And secondly, that I'm speaking at an Atlas audience, which means that many of you are my peers uh, running your own think tanks or working in think tanks in your own countries or are generous supporters uh, of uh, these organizations. So, um, you know, I will, I will go straight to the point. Uh, in my opinion, here's a lesson I learned yesterday. Uh, the Center for Liberal Studies is running an incredible training program for young people um, uh, that includes some really important uh, uh, opinion leaders, including uh, celebrities of uh, the new age, influencers and stuff like that. We've been running, uh, a, a not very intense, but a, a real media, like a real promotional campaign uh, for a couple of weeks. And we have six registrants so far. We're going to get more. We're going to reach our goal, but we have six registrants. Yesterday, the leading financial education influencer in Greece, who is a, a Greek guy from Singapore, who teaches at the University of Singapore, announced a day before that he's going to be in Athens to give a lecture. He sold out 2,000 tickets that he donated to a, a charitable cause. So uh, in, in, to answer and to put my answer in contrast with the noise you mentioned, first of all, we want to make sure we're hearing the noise. Yeah. It's not, before we start cutting through the noise, this is all new, it's happening very quickly, uh, and we have to be constantly exposed to anything new that's happening in AI, anything new influencers are doing, anything new anyone who can address the audiences that we want to influence is doing can inform our tactical arsenal, and I think this is of paramount importance. Um, and uh, to, uh, to conclude my first point, like, and this brings me to something that I'd like to share. It's something that I've been thinking about over the last year, uh, and I'd like to share with uh, especially those who work in comms uh, from, uh, from this group. Uh, my understanding is that influencers, uh, including especially comedians, um, have become a primary target audience uh, that we should be approaching. Uh, I think as a movement, we haven't done enough to reach out to them. In the U.S., I would, uh, I would understand that, you know, having, um, uh, you know, my, my dream debate would be Tom Palmer at the Joe Rogan Experience for three hours. <laughs> but that could be very expensive, and I understand that. But in the same way that in Europe, we don't have access to a lot of funds because there isn't, a, you know, the charitable culture that, is, that exists in the U.S., influencers are going through the same problem there isn't already an established market for them. So they're very eager to work with anyone whom they understand to be more or less uh, on the same side. And that's easy to find because the internet, you know, influencers can be for anything today. You can find one for anything you believe in. Uh, and, and this is, you know, maybe some of the, the scholars in the room might take offense at this, but I'm gonna risk it. Uh, I know that Steve Davis is in the, in the audience, so I, you know, I hope you won't bash me immediately, but wait on after the, the session. I think that modern day influencers fit perfectly into the framework that Hayek laid out into what consists an intellectual. They have direct access to an audience, they control the information they get, and I think they're an underutilized weapon for our movement, which is something uh, that starts from us. We have not done uh, enough of an effort to, to reach out to them. So. Thanks, Alex. And let's bring in Stefan here as well, because I want to get sort of the, the youth element in here, because, you know, everyone's talking about sort of that woke culture has taken over, the next generation doesn't care about our issues. We're, we're, we're the dinosaurs, we're behind the times. Give us a little bit of an insight on what's actually happening, and also what are the lessons we're learning and what can we do about it? You, you are getting old, but it's fine. The new generation <laughs> is all right. Uh, the world will not fall apart when my generation takes over. Um, no, um, this, this is something that's been discussed for the last 10 years or so, um, the, the sort of shift towards the left for the, for the youth, both in the United States, in North America, and, and in Europe. Uh, well, this is certainly a trend, and it's the one that's publicly mostly been uh, propagated. Uh, the reality is that's just a very loud minority. Um, this is true, I think, for anything when you start talking about sort of the culture wars, is you're talking about small extremes that have a big voice. Um, on the ground, uh, so for, for Students for Liberty, we do get a lot of students who are interested in ideas, uh, be it liberal ideas, be it libertarian ideas, uh, students that come from all sorts of places, all sorts of uh, backgrounds. 
Um, and we attract an audience of young people that might not be interested in actively um, taking part in, in um, sort of pushing things forward, but they're coming as an audience. So they're interested in these ideas um, and they wanna hear from, from people who are talking about this. Um, when we talk ab talking about the liberty, liberty movement, we all know that we're sort of maybe not, not on the losing side of the war, but we're definitely uh, not the big, uh, big voice in the room. Um, so trying to find people, getting them interested in our ideas is something that's very important to keep growing the movement uh, and try to become the, the mainstream ideas that, that we, I hope, all wanna be. Uh, to do that, you have to attract sort of the young audience. I think uh, if you're trying to change, you know, somebody who's 56 years old and trying to change their entire political views, that's gonna be very difficult. Uh, but if you get young people, if you get students who are entering university, who are getting politically activated, uh, who are looking for what's going on in the world, who are looking at what is their fu future gonna look like, that's sort of the audience that you, as a, a movement that's trying uh, to build up momentum, uh, that's, that's the target audience that, that you would wanna, wanna get uh, and, and uh, invest your resources in. Uh, because that's gonna give you, you know, 10, 20 years from now, you know, the, the Atlas Forum, there's, what, maybe two, 250 people here, LibertyCon, which is our annual conference, that's around 600, 700 people. If we keep doing what we're doing and we try and engage the younger audience, uh, the next generation, there's no reason why the Atlas Forum, you know, in five years couldn't be 500 people and LibertyCon can be, you know, a 10,000 people conference because now this is a mainstream um, idea uh, and a, a mainstream movement. Uh, but to do that, you, you have to get to the uh, young people. I don't think that the, the, the majority of youth is sort of anti whatever it is that we are standing for. I just don't think we've um, acknowledged them enough and sort of made an active effort to, to approach them um, and see about influencing their worldviews. So we're basically doing the wrong things. I mean, we're still very good in the, free, the, the, the think tank movement to produce these massive reports that no one reads. Should we actually be more on sort of the TikTok, Instagram, yeah. having a sort of shorter, more specific content? We're, we're, we're kind of, yeah. we haven't moved with the times. So <laughs> SFL, started a TikTok channel maybe a year ago or something, and I looked at it and I was like, why are we doing like a TikTok, really? Uh, but that's, uh, that's becoming the, the sort of the number one uh, social media app uh, where we get interactions because that's what the, the, the newer generation is doing. And by the way, I'm now getting students into our program who were born in 2006 or seven, which for me <laughs> is ridiculous. Um, that's so not possible. <laughs> That's what I said, but then I looked at the data, you know. Um, so you're getting people who, who grew up, who don't remember like the, the 2008 economic crash. Like, the, you know, these are people that, for them Obama is like some historical figure, you know. Um, so trying, trying to interact with them using, as you said, very long reports or, you know, whatever, it, it's not gonna work. Um, there are certainly parts of the, of the sort of the youth that are interested in this. We do get a lot of uh, students who are, you know, trying to pursue an academic career. Mm. Uh, and for them, yeah, you can give, we have 20 year olds, they're writing those reports, right? Mm. Uh, but for the majority, if you're trying to um, build a movement, you can't really focus on, you know, a very small minority, you have to go broad. Um, and to do that, you do have to sort of, you know, keep up with the times, uh, which does mean having a TikTok channel, which means, you know, doing Instagram shorts, uh, which means getting the influencers that you were talking about, getting them involved. Um, so we, when we organized LibertyCon now in, in Lisbon last month, we started experimenting with the idea of can we actually use influencers, local influencers in Portugal and Brazil to try and attract uh, a, a, a student audience. This was the first time I think that we did that, like actively trying to reach out to these people. Um, I think we ended up having maybe 20% of tickets that were sold, were sold using the, the codes that we provided to these five um, uh, influencers. And all of them are either on YouTube, so they're having some sort of a YouTube podcast, or they're on Instagram. Now these influencers are within sort of the movements, or they're libertarians, they're anarchists, whatever. So they are sort of people, but they have reach, you know, I think one has something like 60, uh, uh, 60,000 followers on YouTube, the other one had 40,000 on Instagram. So these are people that are 
able to spread our message and ideas to a very broad audience, um, which is something that I don't think think tanks, as you said, can do. Um, but that's when sort of this influencers and when the, where the youth comes in is you get this very long report about something that really matters. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to distribute it to the, uh, to the general public. How do you do that? Yeah. You can come, you know, not even BBC is going to give you an hour time to explain a report. Um, so you go to the influencers, to the people who can create out that report, a five minute uh, walkthrough and explain to the, uh, to the public what does this say and why does this mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alex, how do we do this without dumbing down our content? How do we, how do we walk this tightrope? This is exactly what I wanted to talk about, and I'm really glad it, uh, it came uh, to me, because uh, I'm going to wear my second hat right now, that of uh, the Deputy Director of the Economics Olympiad, which is uh, a program that many of uh, uh, the organizations here participate in, or should be participating in. Uh, so, you know, having organizations like Students for Liberty is of paramount importance in order to cultivate the leaders of the, the freedom movement tomorrow uh, and better and, you know, have better journalists, better academics who are pursuing uh, the cause of a free society uh, around the world. This is of paramount importance. However, the same TikTok message would be more effective if the audience of TikTok was more uh, susceptible to messages like ours. And here's where uh, uh, my research uh, and uh, the research that has been done by um, uh, ENEV and many other organizations around the world comes into play. Uh, I believe we have a huge opportunity in front of us, uh, which is called e investing in economic literacy. Economic literacy has, uh, over the last few years, with studies uh, done by a Greek professor who teaches in Scotland um, uh, at the Adam Smith Business School, his name is George Panos, um, he has found, by using uh, the national survey that has been done in, in the United Kingdom, uh, that uh, there is a robust negative relationship, and I'll translate for those who uh, didn't follow this sentence, uh, a robust negative relationship, because I'm trying to remember it as well, a robust negative relationship between uh, voting for s welfare redistribution and populism and um, uh, uh, economic literacy, uh, a robust, significant, a significant robust relationship. So, um, what does that mean? It means that the more economically literate a population is, the less likely they are to vote for populists and socialists. And that, in my opinion, defines the scope of the people we need to be reaching out. The people who don't believe in socialist ideas and the people who dislike populism. And if the key to changing the climate of ideas in that direction is economic literacy. I think that our movement should do, would be very wise if we were investing in this. And I believe in this so much that I joined the organization uh, that is doing the, the largest worldwide uh, high school competition in economics, uh, the Economics Olympiad, in order to help spread that message around, uh, around the world. And our primary uh, potential uh, uh, partners are Atlas network members, right? There, there are think tanks that will be able to leverage the access they can get to both, you know, lots of sponsorships come with the Olympiad. It's a very uh, wise, uh, business-wise decision to invest in this project, but also uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to make a name for your organizations in your own countries as a leading voice in economic education. So uh, I think our movement can dominate this area uh, and the benefits of that in the next 5, 10, 20 years, uh, I think could be really, really great. I've never been as excited about uh, uh, something that has to do with future generations as investing in economic literacy at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. So to, to, root, to bring it back to SFL, what I think economic literacy can do for the climate of ideas in Europe is similar to what Margaret Thatcher uh, did or Ronald Reagan do in their political scene, which means they forced their opposition parties to become more moderate, to become less populist, uh, to become more sensible. So doing that after a decade uh, of constant threats that have been in question marks, serious question marks, that populism has posed to liberal democracy, economic freedom, free trade, I think this is the best way forward for us. Olga, can we just say a little bit from sort of the Polish example and your experience yeah. on these topics? Uh, I also wanted to follow up on Alexander's comment and yours yeah. as well. Uh, 
definitely agree, but not only economic literacy, but media literacy primarily, I think, uh, coming from a media background. Uh, we cannot have economic literacy if our audiences and citizens are lost in the noise of you know, media disinformation. So those two should definitely go hand in hand. Otherwise, uh, of course, you can learn to recognize those issues. But then again, you are bombarded with information that actually tries to prove you that the other point and the other side is the correct one. So that's something that I think most of us are worried about and preoccupied with. Um, and another thing that you both have touched on, I think, coalition building. And I think that's what we are here for, right? Uh, you have to seek alliances with precisely not your immediate uh, like people you go to, be it influencers, be it you know media personas, be it uh, for our case, uh, we do this uh, annual conference, Freedom Games, uh, for which last year we were awarded Europe Liberty Award. Um, and that's exactly what we have been doing. So we don't only go for you know, promoting ideas and talking about you know, uh, economic freedom and you know, how you should be a liberal in the contemporary world. You also have talks with a famous, uh, I don't know, uh, quantum physics specialist, right? Or we have a musician who like, does those amazing concerts. Or we have writers who come in and who have exactly their own following. These are not our immediate audiences, and they will never be. But bringing those people in who have their own audiences, their own uh, echo chambers, we could say, that's exactly how we can leverage our messaging and how we can break out of our own tiny freedom movement bubbles. So I think that's something that uh, most of us realize, but it's very difficult to do, right? So how do we invite you know, a top level musician to come and speak at your event, not to perform, right? It's always a challenge, but if you're adamant about it, maybe not the first one will agree to come and talk, maybe not the second one, maybe not the 10th, but eventually, you can get there if you're persistent. And that's what we've been doing. And this is exactly how we have found our mm. competitive edge and how we view the future of us as a think tank in the contemporary think tank landscape. Yeah. yeah. Glenn, can I jump in? Just you, you can indeed, sir. But you, just one thing, you're starting to agree <laughs> with each other. So could you sort of throw a few things in? Because I, I, I just <laughs> to push this back and say that, you know, it's extreme and inflammatory content that grabs the attention. It's not the nice stuff in the middle. No one cares about the algorithms are set up in such a way that it's the more extreme and it pushes you towards that. So how do you find that middle ground when you're basically going to get lost in the sea of content? No, I, I, I say go ahead. You know, make it as, as wild as possible. Get make it as wild as possible. Get okay. the attention. Um, so here I disagree. But no, I so good, good. <laughs> so you have you have so. Actually, I'm loud enough, right? Um, you have two. You have two sort of parts of the liberty movement, which I think it works very well. Uh, on one side, you have the think tanks, the researchers, uh, institutions, and organizations uh, that do uh, the, the research and the, and the thinking behind, you know, what's going to be the trend in libertarian or liberal thought in the next, you know, 10, 15 years. On the other hand, you have organizations, um, Students for Liberty, uh, Free the People is here somewhere. Uh, you have organizations that aren't really doing the research, they're not doing the, the thinking, they're doing the execution, or they're, they're uh, spreading the message, right? If you give the Kibis uh, a, a report on, on inflation, they'll make a movie out of it, and they can show that movie to a broad audience that, you know, it's never gonna read your report, but uh, they're gonna watch the movie and they're gonna start thinking about this. You know, maybe it's you know uh, helicopter money, right? That's that's something you can make a movie about. But somebody needs to give you the research uh, for for you to be able to spread an idea. Uh, and liberty movement has very strong, you know, both both sides of the aisle. Uh, and so when you're talking about coalition building and when you're talking about what sort of message are we putting out there, um, that's something I think that we have to all take into consideration. Uh, is it's only when we work together. Uh, as a movement, so everybody supporting each other, uh, is that we can get sort of a clear message out and that we can uh, get the most reach possible because now we are um, putting together all the different audiences of everybody in the room and all the other people that we work with uh, and we can sort of push 
I had uh, a, a unified message, which in the liberty movement is sort of difficult to do because there's a lot of different ideas and there's a lot of infighting. Uh, but I think that's that's not something that's 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 going to be a problem uh, long term. I think there's infighting in any sort of movement. Um, as for sort of the the inflammatory stuff, you do need to grab the headlines. So you know it's. Nobody likes to see how the sausages are made, but you, you got to make those decisions, right? Uh, I think being sort of proactive with your with your messaging is good to do, um, and it's something that is being done in the liberty movement. If you go and watch, uh, you know, libertarian podcasts, all the, the the titles on on YouTube, they're all inflammatory. They're all supposed to make you shocked or uh, make you click and, and watch this video. This is something that everybody does, right? This isn't uh, a specific thing. I don't know. The, you know, the socialists are the ones that are using provocative messaging. They're not. Everybody's using it. Um, and that's the only, the only way you're going to attract an audience that has a very short, um, not a timestamp, but um, um, attention. attention span. Yeah. Mm. A very short attention span today is you got, you got to make them think. You got to make them pause. So you got to figure out what does, how does that look like. Um, I think the sort of you know, easier going messaging that works internally, right? Okay. So if Atlas sends me a newsletter, it doesn't have to have, you know, all caps lock uh, subject. It's coming from Atlas. I'll read whatever, it, whatever it, they're saying. But if I'm a, you know, somebody, a student, first year trying to figure out where does he stand politically, I'm more likely to click on a YouTube, channel, a YouTube video that says, you know, all caps lock inflation is going to help. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, what are the, 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 the consequences of inflation in 2023 are going to be? Question mark. Like, that's not something that's... Yeah. Well, Alex, come back on that. Clickbait and inflammatory content is the way we should be going. Yeah, there isn't one. There isn't one. There isn't one way we should all be going. And this is the beauty of networks. This is the beauty uh, of movements. Uh, we have... Uh, and this is the beauty of Atlas Network training, Brad. Uh, once you understand where you fall on the Overton window, uh, whether your organization is a radical organization or if it's an incrementalist, um, then these answers tend to answer themselves. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in Greece, the first thing when Nikos and I, Nikos sitting here is uh, our executive director, when we first started, uh, restarted the Center for Liberal Studies in Greece back in 2016, 2017, uh, the, all red, the, the existing group of uh, libertarians were, um, let's say, of uh, an Alabama style of libertarians. And that didn't uh, fit in pretty well with what we were and what we represented. So they started bashing us. Uh, and instead of us responding to that, I said, thank you. You're making us look more mainstream, more rational, more uh, moderate. And this is exactly what we needed because our model was incrementalist. We didn't want to shock and awe the people yeah. with our messaging. We just wanted to uh, present free market solutions to real problems today. Uh, so uh, I'm against claiming that there's one way to do that. I think that we are, as a movement, um, we can learn from our individual experimentation. I strongly encourage that. I learn from it constantly. Uh, the Center for Liberal Studies uh, has copied, pasted, like and adapted into Greece programs developed by the Lithuanian Free Market Institute. Our most popular study is Tax Freedom Day. For example, we dominate the, the new cycle for three days every year. Um, and uh, this is the kind of uh, knowledge sharing that benefits all of us from being members of Atlas and uh, having a movement to as a point of reference. So, you know, uh, when I see, uh, uh, you know, catchy titles or very, very aggressive headlines on uh, social media, uh, more power to them. And when I see serious studies that uh, almost kill me from boredom. Uh, I also say more power to that because there's an appropriate audience okay. for each and every one of them. Our job and where we can hold each other accountable is uh, if we notice that we are not doing a very good job and we're wasting opportunities, then we should be very open about how we can take advantage, how we can improve our own strategies. So Olga, following on to that, I mean, basically we, we spend a lot of time on facts, figures, and science and these things, but. Isn't it more sort of emotion that's taking over? We're, we're, we're maybe losing out to the woke community by not getting in the emotional element with too much facts and the actually it, boring stuff. Come on, what's, what do you I think? I don't really think we should position ourselves against the wokeness. Uh, that's the first thing that I've, okay. I've taken from our today's debate in the morning as well. I mean, we should embrace that. 
we should embrace that people are realizing that there are like permanent issues within our societies and we should build on that. Uh, we should acknowledge it, respect it, and see where are the points of contact for us. That's like one point. Another point, uh, emotion, well, of course, but uh, we are emotional animals, we could say. Mm. We pay it, tend to pay attention more to what grabs us. However, <laughs> and here I have to disagree with uh, my former colleague, uh, uh, former, uh, the former speaker, basically, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure if we should kind of, attention grabbing is something that works, but for our movement, I'm not sure this is something that we strive for. It's, there are simple, seemingly simple, or trivial uh, methods and tools that we can use precisely, all caps or, you know, someone we recognize saying something, but uh, does this translate to building a long-term community? We, our experience is that it doesn't. Uh, so if you want to, or if your goal is precisely to bring people in, into your movement, into the freedom movement, uh, grabbing their attention is great, and it has some sort of, you know, follow-up, but it's very short-term. Uh, keeping their attention and keeping them uh, engaged, sometimes entertained as well, and I think yep. that's exactly where the emotion comes in. Yep. Uh, but also keep them involved, and this is where this in attention grabbing fails, right? Very often they will like this, they will share it, and that's it, right? So how do we translate precisely the moment that we do grab the attention to the actual involvement in what we are doing? That's the challenge. We have been struggling with that as well. We have mm. been trying to onboard uh, high schoolers to come and uh, attend uh, our you know, events and forums and be more involved, not only as listeners and participants, but actually doing some content on their own. Uh, with you know, the success rate, I would say it very much depends, right? But if out of 50 people, 50 young people that you bring on board and grasp the, grab their attention, if you have five one year that will stay with you until the next year and then you build on that, that's, mm. I think, in our perception, that's already a success. Yeah. So we have to use emotion, but we try to make it positive emotion, a message of inclusion, of yep. openness, of giving agency, uh, which most of the young uh, generation, they feel that they do have a sense of agency, but at the same time, it seems to be lost in the, all the noise that is happening yeah. around them. There are so many topics that they should care about, as right. that, at least that's what they are told, that eventually they are basically, you know, one foot in this pond and one other foot in another pond, mm. and they don't really know how to navigate that. This is our job, to show them the opportunities, to seek their feedback, uh, and to try to mitigate those two. And I think mm. that's the key, yeah. Well, I mean, bring, bring back in there, Stefan, as well. I mean, just, I think more fundamentally, is a classical liberal approach still relevant and valid in 2023, or is it, has its day and things have moved on? Are we still, are we, are we still back in the right horse? I, th I think you'll have a few opinions here, but uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think the movement is very much alive. Um, again, very loud minorities uh, grab the intentions, but y you talk with people, you know, <laughs> normal people, uh, they have normal political views, they have normal economic views. Define uh, normal. <laughs> but okay. Yeah. Whatever we are, we are thinking, you know, and then move it around a bit. Um, I want to uh, meet the them. Spectrum, the spectrum. Um, I, th I think liberal. I mean, liberal uh, politics is, if it had its heyday, right? Um, there'd be no weapons going into Ukraine, right? Because that that would that would have been one of the things that would have never happened. The the the, the uh, liberal democracies are very much present, and I think they're now having sort of a a, a, a reset, like an awakening, uh, since 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 last year. Um, I think that for a while, especially in really a global movement for for maybe more than a decade, was the populist movement. We saw populist 
uh, governments uh, come into power in a lot of places, from the United States uh, to Europe, uh, to Africa and, and Asia, Latin America. Um, a lot of populists came into power, and now they're sort of, that, that's when this sort of discussions, I think, started, yeah. was like, oh, well, is, is liberal democracy going away? Yeah. Well, where are those uh, governments today? Most of the populist governments are gone. There's a few still standing, but the, the, the big part of the, uh, the majority of them have run their course, uh, and things are changing. Yep. Um, if you look at the United States, uh, if you look at Europe, I think what we're going to see in the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years is a reemergence of, of uh, liberal ideas. Um, you know, it's going to be because, again, like, you know, this, is, this is one of the things that the, the, the invasion of Ukraine, I think, changed in a lot of ways. People really started thinking about, oh, there are consequences to, to politics and there are consequences to electing specific people. Um, and I think that that will, the, the, it's already altered the political uh, discussions uh, that, that the, the general public is, is having in, in the Western world. Um, and I think that will continue towards, you know, we need to build democracies, we need to build uh, friendships and partnerships with, with, with other countries. Um, we, we have to trade. Uh, so I think, like, if you're, if you're uh, you know, uh, working on anything that's free market, I think you're about to see, um, you know, the best, uh, best period you've had in the last, you know, since the beginning of the of the of the 21st century. So, so Alex, I think they're very much alive. Excellent. So Alex, the pendulum swinging back to us. Well, um, I'll just I'll just say I'm delighted that uh, the head of SFL is so optimistic. I think that's how it should be. I got a, I got a, a think about the future. You know, yes. But you should spend more time yes. in Poland. <laughs> um, I agree, and uh, I'll try to. You know, for me. Um, the future is every day it's becoming even more unpredictable, right? We don't know what AI is going to bring us tomorrow. Um, uh, in the same way that, you know, two weeks ago, you couldn't do a bunch of things that I saw that you can do with AI today. I've, I've been on a constant deep dive over the last month. Those of you who follow me on Facebook know. So um, what, I'm, uh, what, what troubles me is our ability to influence the process, right? Uh, I don't know where the climate of ideas is going to be in five years from today. Uh, I know that the, the topics that are at the top of the agenda as we speak are very relevant, and we have classical liberalism has some really, really convincing and good answers. Uh, protectionism, freedom of speech, uh, economic growth, unemployment, inflation. Like, I really believe we have the best solutions for all these problems. Um, However, that doesn't mean that we're going to get our way, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic, neither, nor am I pessimistic about this. What I am worried is whether the, the Hayekian theory of change still exists and will continue to exist. Like, if the way we can move societies towards, towards freedom is by winning the battle of ideas through uh, swaying more and more intellectuals in our way. Um, the way that this balance, there are so, there, there are so many different levels um, that are involved in this theory of change that all experience simultaneous and uh, very uh, aggressive um, change, uh, that this is what keeps me up at night, is whether this will be true tomorrow, whether this will be true in five years, or whether we will be able to catch up with those changes. And what does our role as a think tank uh, how does our role as think tanks evolve in this process, right? So, um, you know, if we, if we can answer that, we would have a better idea of how we can influence the final outcome uh, mm -hmm. of that time, uh, primarily by comparing with what our ideological opponents are doing, right? Because this is something I think we haven't spent enough time doing as a movement. We, we're not keeping up with the tactics and the strategies that are employed by the left regardless of whether we yeah. can employ them or not, because, you know, um, uh, when you're a shameless statist, you can use government money, you can use uh, all kinds of tactics that aren't available to us, uh, but we should be keeping track of how they are adjusting into this new reality. And I think this is also a warning call uh, for the, the brighter than me people in the room, which is the, the vast majority of all of you here, um, uh, to have in mind 
to keep up with what they are, what our opponents are doing, uh, but also constantly experiment in, into reconfiguring our role in this ever-changing process. Mm. So Olga, everything to play for. Sorry. Everything to play for. The future <laughs> is still uncertain. We have to. We, we have to. But it's always been it. the case, right? It's it always has. been the case. I mean, mm. we could have talked about it 20 years ago. The future was also uncertain, and 100 years ago as well. I mean, this premise does not and change. The uh, and the classical liberal principles do not change either. I mean, it's still the same. It's still valid. The way we go about it, and here I completely agree, the way we go about it and what we do with them changes, and it will continue to change. But it's, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's actually an opportunity, for sure. Uh, it's definitely something, as Alexander has said, we need to experiment with. We need to find our own ways, uh, what works for us specifically in our think tank. We do have partners, other partners in Poland, who do similar work, but they do, you do use completely different channels of communication, and they do use different tools, others than us. Uh, and that's fine, because it works for them, it doesn't work for us specifically. Uh, so exactly, for being up to date uh, is I think the key. What does it mean? Well, it means that we will feel uncomfortable very often, yeah. right? Like a lot. Uh, but we should not be afraid of that. We should embrace this, uh, this sense of feeling uncomfortable and try to push through it to the other side where at some point we can be okay, we don't know everything and we will never do. But there is this tiny piece of uh, our reality that we can manage and that we can communicate and that we can bring people on board. And I think that's, I think that's the near future of think tanks. And I saw from what you, saw, uh, you, you said uh, both about what you are doing, I think that's precisely it, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to find your own small piece of ground where actually what you do does have a direct impact and trying to grow that piece mm. of, of reality. Yeah. So seek, seek the influence and seek discomfort at the same time. Yeah. I think with that, I think it's a great opportunity to actually open the floor up to discussions. There's a lot of discussion going on. For, first here, Max, if we can just do that, and then we're going back. Uh, two at the back and one here. Yeah, so in, in that order. No tough questions, Marek, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would like to disagree a bit with Alexander and Stefan on, on one issue uh, and uh, point to something that was not mentioned in this discussion because you said a lot about young people and I'm aware of thousands of great projects globally targeted and young generation and how they will influence future. But I think there is one big group that is neglected by the liberty movement and these are older people. Yeah. We are living in the aging society. There are more and more people 60 plus. Uh, in Poland in 2050 we will have 40% of people 60 plus which is a big group of voters. Globally there will be 2 billion people 60 plus in the whole world and I think especially in developed countries this will be really influential political group. And I rarely see projects that are in the liberty movement that are targeted at older population. I think this should be something also interesting for the Atlas Network to discover how and what we should do to be also influential in this group that will be just super important politically. And uh, I'm really happy that there are so many great projects about uh, young people, but I think uh, this group should also be targeted in the future. So changing minds and teaching old dogs new tricks, how are we approaching that in our countries? Yeah, well... well um, Not effectively, apparently. <laughs> um, I, I don't know the particular... First of all, if Marek says he disagrees with me, I, I, I really value his opinion. I, I listen very closely. So um, I, I, I see what you're trying to say. My, my immediate response is to that is that uh, when, you, when we're trying to approach younger people, um, we have to do less unlearning um, in, in political terms uh, because, you know, my background, is, have, I've been involved in political campaigns as well. The fewer things you have to convince someone, the more likely it is you'll be able to convince them to, to vote for you. So with older people, um, formulated opinions, established interests, uh, um, uh, better, clearer worldviews, whether right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, as, as far as uh, the communications that are necessary in order to bring them on our side, uh, they, they, by default, they're going to have to be uh, more intensive, 
Uh, and I'm not against that. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to figure out uh, whether that kind of an investment, if you, if, you, if you say the current situation is not good for us and I want to improve the climate of ideas in my country in 20 years, um, probably most of the 65-year-olds in 20, 30 years um, will not be a very sound investment, let's put it that way, to, to invest in that direction. Olga, so, what do you think? Yeah, uh, we've uh, known each other with Marek for quite a long time. We have done projects together, even in his previous position. Uh, what we are doing uh, with our Freedom Games Forum is once we started, the first edition, we, was actually, we were actually startled by the fact that half of all attendees were precisely 60, 60 plus. Uh, we were shocked because these were not at all the audiences that we were targeting. But we saw a potential there. Uh, and by trying to also include uh, speakers of their generation and topics valuable for them, we tried to tap into that as well. Why? Because there are not many events precisely where those people could go and listen to the people they want to listen outside of, you know, public television, <laughs> probably, which is not definitely uh, the place to, 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 to follow and the outlet to follow. Uh, it is indeed a challenge, as Alexander has said, but very often uh, the elderly generation actually feels that they are precisely not uh, listened to, that uh, their golden days are over. That's what the messaging is for some of our activities as well, right? We are targeting the youth because exactly we can see a long-term cooperation with them. But at the same time, exactly, in Poland, probably the majority of, well, it's not probably, it's a fact, the majority of uh, governmental uh, peace voters are the elderly. And this is exactly the group that we have to somehow bring closer to us, or at least more further away from the values that we do not believe in, that are harmful for our societies, economies, and uh, political landscape. Uh, so trying to find the areas that you can bring them on, even in a tiny, tiny regard, is very important. So basically, the bottom line is this. Diversify whatever you do, if you have the capacity, of course. Not, not all of us will have the capacity to do that. With our forum, where we have uh, 3,500 uh, uh, attendees, right, we can do that because we have like 100 sessions that we do over two and a half days, and we have a potential to give them the space to come in, to feel listened and heard, because that's the key. And very often, these are precisely the people that ask the toughest questions because they very often claim that we didn't have a chance to do that before, right? And that's it. Um, so if you see the potential for doing that, definitely a path worth exploring. So forcing the old people to unlearn what they've learned, as Yoda would say. Now the gentleman at the back, please. Yes. So uh, I would like to say that I 100% agree with Marek. Uh, our movement should have deliberate yeah. communication strategies towards the older people. Uh, for one, okay, if we're talking about people who are 65 or 70 years old, well, guess what? In 20 years from now, they're still going to be around, most of them, because of uh, life expectancy, okay? So that's just a statistical reality. Then they vote more, and, and, and they're m a bigger group. So... Uh, I'm not saying give up on the youth, but I'm saying as an investment strategy, right? If you have a portfolio in the stock market, you don't buy only one stock, you diversify. And as part as, you're at the, uh, as the investment strategy of Atlas and uh, of the funders, of which I am, you know, there has to be something targeted for the older people. And my sense is that it's not so much about getting them to unlearn stuff, but it's about appealing to their sense of duty to the country and to their grandchildren. So the communication stance is to say, you know, you have been, uh, you know, let's say a successful German, think about the future of Germany and think about the future of your grandchildren. So you're still referring to the youth, but in a communication targeted 
to the older folks. And I really believe that as a movement, we're not doing enough of that. My second comment quickly is about knowing your brand. Whenever you have your strategy, you have to be very aware of your brand. And so for instance, my institute at some point associated with the libertarian radio station that I personally love. Uh, they have hard rock music, they make uh, jokes, including uh, sexually explicit jokes and things like that. And, and we associated with them because they have a big audience, but there was a backlash because the people that support us felt that it was incompatible with our brand. So, you know, uh, I think whatever you decide to be radical or not radical, first you have to understand what is the brand that you have developed over the past years. Exactly. Can I yes. jump in on, yeah, the, yeah, on the first thing? Um, what we were talking about uh, earlier with all the, the, the educational uh, stuff that we were trying to do, that's the, the, that's the informal education that we as think tank, think tanks, as uh, non-government organizations are providing primarily to the youth, but also, I mean, to people any age. Um, but I think for the youth, the, the big thing that you have to do is provide that sort of um, um, education that's outside of the main systems, meaning universities and, and government-run schools. And that's something that we as a movement do, I think, uh, very well. So we are educating uh, the, the, the youth that then, you know, part of it will become part of the movement, meaning they're gonna end up working for, for all of us. I think when you're talking about the older generations, right, the, 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 the voters in pretty much every country, um, I don't think, as you said, it's not really an educational thing, it's more of a political thing. I think if you're trying to influence uh, older generations uh, to sort of take our ideas in, you need to start looking at uh, changing the political landscape of a country. I think older people, the one, number one thing they care about is politics. Who's running the country and how are they running it? So you as think tanks and as advisors and lobbyists, you have a chance here to try and influence, uh, influencing elections sounds, <laughs> sounds wrong, uh, but uh, you have, a, you have a opportunity to influence political movements in your countries by finding political candidates that hold our ideas, but they can appeal to older generations that might be more conservative or, you know, or, or, or more uh, liberal. Um, so I think if you're talking about older generations and, and uh, creating projects for them, I think that's sort of a political sphere, uh, more than, than an educational one um, or you know, any, any sort of a promotional one. I think you have to talk about politics and you have to talk about finding people who can run as elections and, and appeal to, uh, to this generation. Thanks, Stefan. May I? Just a quick remark. I'm not sure okay. it's that much political as economic at times, it especially these days with inflation and, you know, well, I can, I can buy government, it. Like of course it is. But not necessarily. So some, basically, <laughs> most people of the elderly generation that we have worked with, uh, some of them are not really political at all. At least they don't think they are. So it's finding the values that they share that is precisely something that we can do, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was quite surprised by a comment that, that Stefan made, uh, if I got it right, that populism is sort of fading away. Now, I, my feeling is that if you look at how the Biden and for that matter, the Ursula von der Leyen in Europe speak, yes, they are much different from the Trumps in the sense that they are mo more educated and perhaps more gentle. But if you look at what they say, and even more so what they do, I don't really see that much difference. So my question, let me formulate it in Marxian terms, is assuming that the rhetorical superstructure of populism is, is declining, would you say that the underlying economic and ideological structure of populism is also fading away? For you. for you, specifically for you, Stefan. <laughs> um, Stefan, don't duck this one. Yeah, yeah. Look um, him in the eye and th respond thanks. to him. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> politics change, right? If you went 100 years you know, uh, back in time, uh, the people that you would vote for uh, had very different messaging back then. I think whatever message, I think the populist movement, what it did is it sort of changed the game. Right when Trump won the elections 2016, everybody took notice, and everybody was like, All right, "What did he do 
to become the person that got elected. Because if you, you remember 2016, early on, everybody thought it was a joke. Um, and I think that did influence pretty much everybody in politics, including traditional political systems and political parties. They started looking into um, populist actions uh, and strategies that they could take and, and try to work that in into their system. Um, I think populist measures, not populist measures, but populist messaging is something that we just have to get used to. And that's something that everybody's gonna use. And I think if we're talking about this movement, I think we sort of have to use. Because our opponents are a lot bigger than we are, right? The, the liberty movement is sort of, it's, it's still very small and we're trying to fight giants. Um, the only thing we can do is stay on the offense always. And to do that, you have to, you have to be loud, right? Um, and populist, populism, when it comes to, to the marketing side, is very loud. Like that's why we know of populists is because uh, they appeal to a very loud minority that can then attract uh, the majority. Uh, so I think if you're talking about um, using populism, I think there are some things that we can learn, uh, but other, otherwise stay away from the actual uh, execution uh, of populist uh, politics. So fighting giants and having impact. Sadly, we could have had another hour on this because this is fundamental to what we're doing in terms of the future think tanks. I don't know about you, but I've got so many fantastic ideas about this that I'm gonna sort of steal with pride and implement here. So thank you very much for the, the energy and engagement from the audience. And thanks once again to the, to, to the panel for their great uh, topics, uh, introductions, but also the ability to take on any questions as well and answer truthfully. So thank you very much indeed. It's been great fun. Thank you. And Max is going to, we're back in the ballroom, I believe, uh, for the Shark Tank and lunch. <laughs>